Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thanks for being here, Prabhu. So basically with devotees doing the interviews, I'd like to hear a little bit about how you met this kind of devotees and how you got involved with the movement, where that was, so on. Sure. So I was going to an international boarding school in Switzerland, in the Alps, near Interlaken, and one of my colleagues, he wasn't a close friend, he was just an acquaintance, he, he started to do strange things. He, he started to pray before, before the meals, which is kind of odd. We were in a, in, a, in a big hall taking our meals, and I remember very distinctly, he, he, would, he would pray before every meal, and I was very visual, and he was, yeah, it was noticeable. So somehow I got into an art class with him, and we were doing, um, you know, cutting linoleum, you know, okay. and then you make prints okay. with that. Yeah. So I did a Tibetan Lama and he did Prabhupada. Oh, wow. And he used the picture of the Bhagavad Gita as his, as his um, model. As his model, yeah. Wow. And so he showed me the Bhagavad Gita. I said, can I have it? He said, no, you can't have it. It's mine, but I can show it to you. So naturally what you can't have, you want it. Yeah. It says reverse psychology. It worked. Cool. So he was already practicing, still going to the forest and smoking weed, and, but, but he was already chanting and reading. So he invited me to the temple. So in the spring of 1984, I went and I got to the temple. It was around nine o'clock and the devotee said, it's already all over. It's already done. And I'm like, wow. I mean, when do you guys start? They said four o'clock. Wow. But they had saved me a plate of prasad, so I encountered very new smells and tastes and experiences. But what really struck me was that everybody's super nice and very generous. People were giving me food, they were giving me books, they were, one person came, just handed me a set of japa mala of chanting beads what? and said, this is what we do. And uh, you just do four every day, four rounds. And I was 15 years old, you know, a sports kid. I'm like, sir, yes, sir. And uh, yeah, and I started and because there wasn't like, oh, how are you feeling today? And sure, maybe, sure. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, it was very direct. It was a very clear sense that this is a mission. Yeah. We have a mission, we have a purpose. This is where we're going. Got it. And you can be part of it. Nice. So it was very interesting. I started reading the Gita on the first canto, chanting my four rounds after school. I, I finished with the boarding, I mean, with that uh, boarding school for two years, and I did another year of government school. So I was staying at home, and I went to the park behind my house every day, and I chanted my four rounds. Wow. And I thought, wow, I'm a monk, you know, I'm really doing it. And <clears throat> My mom allowed me to go to the temple twice a month. Then I noticed that there are people chanting 16 rounds, people are chanting more rounds, and I was like, okay, maybe there is some room for improvement. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Yeah. So then I got more and more, more and more into the practice. Uh, on the first visit to the temple, I became vegetarian, and and I appreciated the the lifestyle of the devotees, it just made sense to me. Mm. Mode of goodness type of yeah. lifestyle. And then it took me like six months to convince my mom to sign off on me so I could join the ashram. My friend had already joined. I remember very, very graphically, I went to the temple and he was in the basement watch, washing this huge pile of pots and he didn't wear any shoes, he was barefoot it was a uh, tile floor, was wet, and he had a huge smile on his face. And it, to me, it reminded me of this scene in the, in the movie of uh, St. Francis, uh -huh. uh, Brother Moon, Sister Sun, yes, where, yes. where the monks are building the church in the snow, yes. and they're barefoot in their robes. And I was like, yeah, this is the real deal. Like, uh -huh. you know, they're doing it. Nice. So 
I had to break my mother's heart in order to make her proud. And I believe we all have had that experience one way or the other yeah. with our parents that we had to break with the old in order to start something new. Yeah. And then to eventually, we got the blessings or the appreciation of our friends and relatives. And so that's what happened. And I heard that there was something called a Christmas or prop up marathon as it's known now. And I wanted to definitely take part in that. I had read that book, distribute books, distribute books, distribute books by Satsuma Rutmaraj. Okay. All the collected quotes of Srila Prabhupada. Oh, that early on you had read yeah, that Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's no secrets about what's going on here. I was already out with the devotees carrying their books and, and, and I knew wow. what was going on. So I was very intrigued. I wanted to be part of that mission because I saw that the devotees were very, they were very vibrant. There was a clear sense of purpose and there was a lot of drive. So my mom said, you have to finish school and then in spring you can, you can do whatever you want. But I knew that if I missed this opportunity of this December marathon, then it's just not be, not be so great. Yeah. So I had to aggravate things at home and escalate it to the, <laughs> to put it mildly till she said, you can leave, but you have to leave right now. I see. And I said, sure, just sign right here and then I'll be out of <laughs> your hair. So that's what happened. Now she really likes the choices I made. And um, yeah, at one point I gave beats to my younger brother. We're four. There's the oldest brother, then my older sister, myself, and the younger brother. Okay. So I gave Joppa beats to my younger brother. My mom took him away and she said, I'll give one to God, not two. So I said, younger bro, I'm sorry, you know. It's, uh, it's going to be me, you know. you got to do what you got to do. Nice. <laughs> he st still turned out good. He's, he's a good guy. So, yeah, that's that. Then I, I moved in uh, in the first week of December and joined the marathon. I was too young to go out by myself, okay. but they took me and I carried the books for different devotees. I counted their Lakshmi, I did accounts, I did shopping, I was around, I was just a helper. But uh, it was very good because I saw many different devotees. I saw what works, what doesn't work, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I see some people who are really excelling, some people who stalled, some people who went down. I so I could observe all this and it was very, uh, yeah, it was very sobering to, wow. to be part of that experience. What an introduction to temple life that was in 84 yeah okay so i joined on a thursday and i went traveling on a sunday i never gotten what people call bhakta training or bhakti shastri or you know this seminary or that thing yeah, you you just joined the sankirtan army of chaitanya mahaprabhu and this is the school of life yeah. and you learn as you go <laughs> and you swim or sink and most people swam some some disappeared but overall yeah, it, was a, it was a great time because yeah. we were one family and it was very clear what was the goal and what we were trying to accomplish. This is a temple in Zurich? Zurich, Switzerland, okay. yes. How many devotees approximately were there at that time? Must have been around 50. Okay. At least half of them on Sankirtan, the other half in the temple. And then we had a farm also in the south. The Italian speaking side in Ticino. So there was maybe another 20 there. Okay. And then a couple of dozen scattered around the country. There must not have been more than a hundred devotees in the country okay. at, at that time. Okay. Like that. Wow. Yeah. So how long was it before they started letting you go out on books by yourself? Um, yeah, then come January, they said, we have a debt and we need to collect for that BBT debt. So they put me on paraphernalia to sell candles, carved candles okay. for three months, which I didn't like that much, but it wasn't like a time where, where they were asking you for your opinion or for your, sure, sure, sure. you could check options. Sure. So I went, I did it, I learned how to talk to people, I learned how to present a product, how to, how to make a sale. And uh, yeah, that was that. And after three months, they switched us to books. And we went door to door. And 
yeah, we learned how to deal with life. rejection, how to deal with everything that life throws at you when you step out into the great unknown. But for me, it was very clear that, that this is what I like to do because I'm a, I'm a person who is very much mission driven. So it, it was, yeah, I felt it was the right fit. Nice. So we went door to door, we distributed books. And then in the marathons, we went on the street. Now we covered Switzerland every two years, going door to door, knocking on every door in the country. Wow. Then uh, after, after Bhagavan left in 86, we yeah. inherited half a million French books. So I went to India in 86. I got initiated here in Mayapur. Okay. And that same year, a few big uh, Sonal Acharyas, a few big gurus left. Mm. So we inherited over half a million books and they came to Switzerland. It's a long story. Or the devotees just didn't know what to do with them now or devotees? No, France, basically the government in France was very hostile and they, they were claiming taxes. So they wanted to confiscate the books. I see. So in order to save the books, they, 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 they moved them from, from France to Italy. In Italy, the printer, Bruno, he hadn't been paid. So he also wanted to get a hold of the books. <laughs> so, so they, they drove them over the, over the green border into Switzerland. And uh, all of a sudden we had half a million French books because we have two million French speakers in Switzerland, okay. the Geneva okay. side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in one meeting with Harikesh, then Maharaj yeah. uh, Prabhu, uh, they asked anyone who speaks French and I was like, yeah, I had French in school. And so, okay, there you go. Wow. And I had a team of two or three devotees and for six years we distributed all those books. Wow. And it was wonderful experience going to every town and village, meeting people door to door, business to business on the street. And, uh, it was wonderful experience. Would you cross over into France also and distribute in no. just Switzerland? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. No, we stay pretty local. That's also historical reasons because the two Sonal Acharyas didn't get along so yeah, well. Yeah. So we knew more about India or about America than we knew about France or Italy because there was not such a yes. close closeness. Even though in our country we have both Italian and French speakers, it just wasn't the culture. Got it. So then in 1991, so I, I, I started distributing and I, I really, I was thriving, it really took off. In 1991, I was number one in the world on book distribution. I got a call from my spiritual master to come to Mayapur that we just made you the minister of book distribution. I jump on the next flight and come here. So. Wow. I was there the next day and, and I asked him, what is my job description? And he said, there ain't no job description. You, you, we're not there yet, you know, in our organizational structure, but you're already doing it. So don't worry about it. Got so it. just keep going, just Got keep it. doing what you're doing. And if there's anyone who gives you trouble, send them to me, I'll take care of them. And I said, okay, deal, we, we, we can do this, you know? Right. So there was a clear understanding about roles and you didn't have to second guess on what you needed to do. Yeah. So then I, in the nineties, I traveled, um, all over the world. I did one to two world tours every year, liaison with national Sankirtan leaders. We came up with courses, uh, sitting on the GBC. We made some of these courses mandatory for all Sankirtan devotees in order to ensure a certain basic standard education for people going out facing the public five day course. And yeah, thousands of devotees took that course. That's, the, that's the course you've given here. Yes. In yeah. And we trained 150 teachers globally to teach that course in their locales. And we passed the law up on the GBC. So I got a little taste of what it means to sit in meetings and then pass legislation and see yeah. how much or how little you can actually accomplish yeah. in such kind of environments. Yeah. Meanwhile, still being on the ground and dealing with new people and with local leaders. 
Yeah. It was a very, very good experience. Yeah. So that's basically what happened from 84 to 98. We had a lot of marathons. We had five marathons every year, Gorpunima Marathon, uh, Nishinga, Chaturdasi Marathon, Chamastami Marathon, the Guru Marathon, and the Prabhupada Marathon. So there was pretty much marathon all year round. Wow. On top of that, we had one or two marathons a year where we are selling either uh, records, later on CDs or cassette tapes or candles or prints or some people in paintings to finance the farm and other projects as mm -hmm. such, which at some point became a little a little distracting because it was just too much of a too much of a switch yeah. between going out as a monk and talking about Krishna and then just going and doing a transactional selling thing, some selling some product. Yeah. And it was mainly uh, expediency at how to get um, profit. And that was mostly to just cover temple overheads and things like that. Up till 86, the books were pretty much given out for whatever because there was so much money coming in from paraphernalia. I see. Then in 86, we switched to double BBT price. Books weren't given away cheaply anymore. The scores dropped. We had to learn how to present the books on the merit of the books. And it took, it was a learning curve. It took almost half a year. I see. We were back to functionality. People had to learn new ways. And because before you could just walk up to somebody and hand them a stack of books and say, hey, get whatever you like, you know, and somebody else footed the bill, because but that wasn't the, possible. So the, the, a lot of the paraphernalia distribution before that, before 86, was financing book distribution. Yes, yes. And also expanding, uh, you know, the, the farm was very expensive to lease. And a lot of people did paintings. A lot of those devotees didn't last. They didn't really stick around. They started going private, then drifting off. Got it. and dropping Krishna consciousness for the most part. Got so it. we saw that it wasn't really a sustainable model how to how to grow a spiritual community because if you come for a spiritual experience, you don't want to be stuck, uh, you know, selling um, art that is done like on a on an assembly belt. Yeah. And and then basically misrepresenting it wasn't really a model that that was sustainable so it's not the same taste yeah yeah and also for those of us who did you know candles or or music it was just too much of a too much of a shift continuously changing and basically it's contrary to to our lifestyle also because some of them started going to restaurants and bars and clubs late night to sell those items because that's where people go out to party and they have money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you're, you know, trying to live a monastic lifestyle, mm -hmm. which means being celibate, getting up early, mm -hmm. being clean, being virtuous, being truthful. Yeah. <laughs> it's not exactly the yeah. same, yeah. the same type of energy, the same type For of vibration. Sure. So unfortunately we lost a, good, a lot of good men and ladies and so yeah it was a hard learning so in 86 the earth shook and a lot of people got a, a reality check then there was guru reform and the zonal acharya system got slightly modified it, things opened up there was more gurus i remember harikesh maharaj then he invited all his god brothers to be spiritual masters. The brahmacharis and sannyasis, they all accepted and the grihasas all declined. So, but it opened up to some extent, but it was still zonal, the zonal ethos was still very much mm. ingrained. And then in 98, he left. And then, then a lot of rethinking had to happen. There was a lot of, a lot of turmoil because people saw that this isn't working. They started to reevaluate the organizational structure, their own lives. A lot of people got married. A lot of people changed their service or their occupations. And yeah, it was very, very sobering uh, 
experience. I'd like to jump back and ask a couple questions. Sure. About, um, like when you, you said you got initiated in 86. Yes. So what was the, was it just kind of expected everyone would take initiation from Arikesh? Yeah, that was, uh, that was the only, that was the, culture. that was the only product on the shelf. I got mean, the, the, if you liked somebody else, you better just book a one way ticket to Australia or to got it. South America. But in general, did that happen? The voters who joined, did they leave and go other? Yeah, places maybe to... once every five or 10 years, Got but <laughs> not, not so much. Not so much. Yeah. yeah. And okay. it was pretty much, yeah, you're, you know, I'm going to San Francisco. I heard there's a gold rush there and uh, I might not come back, sure, but sure, sure. I love you guys. Bye. Got it. But I mean, at the time in the eighties, he, from what I understand, his zone was practically the most successful and all of this kind. I mean, especially yeah. In some ways, it defines always. You know, it depends always how you define success. You know, the way we define success defines our success. So, so what yardstick do we apply? Sure. It was definitely number one in terms of book distribution and also book production. Uh, North European BBT was doing about 150 titles a year. Wow. Pretty much consistently all throughout wow. because they have dozens of languages and a great team. And we <coughs> distributed a lot of books, which meant there was, there was, <coughs> there was, um, yeah, that, that was the focus. That was just, that was just what, what our mission was, was to really mass distribute Srila Prabhupada's teachings. And people took that as a, as their, as their focal mission in life. But when it came to approaching the, you know, taking initiation, taking shelter. Yeah. Nowadays in ISKCON, we have a sense of, you know, kind of. You connect with Prabhupada. Getting, you, know, you can, you know, Prabhupada is there, the Prabhupada is there, but also get to know the spiritual master, kind of assess yeah. the fit and make sure. No, that, that wasn't there. That wasn't part no, of No, that wasn't part of that. Yeah. It was just, you know, this is Prabhupada and this is the This is his representative yeah. for this part of the world. Exactly. And that's just the system. That's just how it works. Yeah. Got it. I'm sure that was not the original intention, but that's what it ended up that's to what be. It became, yeah. And you can say it was expedient. It was, uh, it's, you can say it's more productive to have all the disciples of one guru in a place. But then again, if you understand a little bit about, uh, <clears throat> cross pollination <laughs> and about, you know, diversity, yeah. unity and diversity, then you can also see that <clears throat> once trouble hit, people had similar trouble and yeah. they weren't that much able to help each other yeah. because they were going through the same thing. Yeah. And it's not really our tradition. It's not really our culture. Yeah. There's supposed to be more of a response sense of individual responsibility when it comes to seeking a guru and yeah. assessing and so on and so. Yeah. But Diksha was overemphasized and, and yes, we had many God uncles and, aunties and we took guidance from them and yeah. we were very grateful yeah, yeah, yeah. yet Diksha was was at the time at the time the the most important thing and and that was pretty much taken care of just by the by the structure the culture that was got it then in in the mid 80s yeah towards end of 80s it slightly opened up, it changed, it became more diverse. There were disciples of other gurus and it became like 50-50, but it was still understood that, uh, who is the boss, who, yeah. who, who runs the show yeah, because yeah, they're yeah. gurus, but they don't really have a say in management. Yeah. Of course, some of them later on became zonal gurus or acharyas in other parts of the sure, world. Sure, 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 sure. And so we're still 2024. Fast forward, we're still being haunted by like ghost of fast sonal acharya yeah. <laughs> syndrome because yeah. Yeah. it's it's not not going away just because we, we yeah. pass a law or two and we say this is abolished and this is the new yeah. Yeah. culture is is what what gets uh, people vote with their feet so whatever gets done is what defines the status quo what defines the culture yeah what about as you got into the role of 
the the Sankirtan minister. Yeah. Can you share any any episodes or experiences of what that was like as you started to travel? I mean, you were pretty young at that time, right? Yeah, I was uh, at the bright old age of uh, 23 years. Wow. And I was sitting with the big boys. Not at the big table. I was sitting at the small table, sure, but sure, I was sure. watching the big boys. Yeah, yeah. So I saw what was going on. <coughs> and... <coughs> Excuse me. You may have to cut this. <coughs> we can cut it. So, yeah, I, I went from just traveling in Harikesh Maharaj's zone, where I visited every temple twice a year, to pretty much going to every continent once a year. And um, yeah, it was very, very interesting to get a different type of exposure, to see the commonality and also the, the differences, to be more in a role of a trainer, of a teacher, rather than just doing long hours and big volume myself. I slightly shifted from, you know, you, you're a pro and then, then you, you become trainer, yeah. coach yeah. become manager like that yeah, i still kind of went role. back to do the marathons but my role slightly shifted so it was very interesting and in some places very well received and in other places not so much so it was interesting to see also how iskan because it's a very young organization so it's not like standardized like you you step into a a franchise of a of any sorts you have a standardized look and a standardized type of behavior yeah. product and interaction you know what to expect yeah yeah and it's not at all like that so yeah. in some places you know they treat you like royalty and in other places they rather not have you there because they think you're a threat to to the local operation so it was a good it was a good experience it, it helped me to to appreciate the the diversity and also to see that Krishna consciousness is a process. Prabhupada came to teach us principles. He expected from us to fill in the details, to be more process-centered rather than uh, personality cult-based, which is not a sustainable model. Yeah. And yeah, I got sent also to a few places on missions to do some investigations and scouting and see what was going on and try to help the local the local leaders to to improve their their preaching and their book distribution and that was very that was very uh was very nice do, i really like doing that do any um, success stories prominently come to mind like a place where you went that was really you were able to make a big impact and they were really appreciative and um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I went to Russia for 25 years, from 1991 to 2016. So initially, we went there and we were very much worshipped because we were the biggest book distributors in the world. Myself and Hari Namananda and Rini Sutta Prabhu, and there was festivals with hundreds and hundreds of devotees and then going to the different regions dealing with the congregation dealing with the local devotees and because of the language <clears throat> because the language barrier you need a translator <clears throat> so it's not really easy to go and distribute there i see so you have to basically you're forced to work through somebody or yes. with somebody yeah and that was a good that was a good experience but then also I saw that as the time went on, they had more and more local leaders coming up. They had local sannyasis who are now gurus. And so there was less need for going there. Mm. India, similar type of a situation. Got it. That initially it was very chaotic and very sporadic and spontaneous book distribution in India. Yes. 
and in the early 90s yes very much so and then as as uh the some of the gbc's the leaders they they really put focus on it we did a lot of effort to 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 train course to train leaders to train teachers to work with the main centers who then worked with their satellites yes and so india is doing fantastic and yeah. russia or the formerly you know what we call russian speaking countries <clears throat> are doing pretty good so yeah there's plenty of that but that's not really uh, our success you know it's paramijate see krishna sankirtan it's just right. it's a, the sankirtan movement the process works the potency the purity of Prabhupada's words and of his sacrifice his surrender and his dedication his full faith in the instructions of his spiritual master yeah is what carries on the the art is really how to be of help and try not to get in the way yeah because it's easy to get caught in our own story and, <laughs> and think like yeah 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 we got this and then krishna shows us that you know you're just insignificant you're really not not the doer and that's sobering but it's a very welcome and a very important realization because we can't make any advancement unless we realize that Krishna, Krishna's mercy is all I'm made of. And, and if I'm not part of his team, if I'm not an instrument in his hands, like Lord Brahma, who realized that, yeah, I, I know a little bit of a few tricks, you know, I tried my stuff and, uh, it didn't work so great. <laughs> I got bewildered. And <laughs> what happened here? Yeah. Where all these cowboys, you know, where all these calves come from? Yeah. He was totally scratching his foreheads. And so we all have those moments. And then we realize that Krishna is doing the magic and it's his magic. And if I'm in the right state of mind, Krishna consciousness, then, then Krishna will allow me to get a glimpse of that magic. He, he, he lifts the veil and you can actually see how the internal and the external energy are working together simultaneously mm -hmm. to bring either people closer to Krishna or to seemingly make them drift further apart. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's very, very interesting. So to me, this has been the, the, the baseline, the theme, the, the red thread that, that pulled throughout um the last four decades and, and i'm very grateful for that and that's what kept me going so could you share a little bit about when you first met uh, my sheshika prabhu yeah my sheshika prabhu was um one of the big book distributors in the early days not the early early days but the later part of the 70s and then he, he, he uh, yeah, lived in the Bay Area and mostly did his own preaching, had his own program. I, I got to meet him in the 90s when I came to the U.S. So I spent time, quality time with him at his home in the Bay Area. And also when he went to Festival of Inspiration in New Vrindavan and Ratiatra and LA, San Francisco, New York. So we established our relationship and I saw that he's one of my mentors, kind of took guidance, shiksha from him and him and his wife, Mother Nicola, they invested a lot of uh, affection and, and uh, attention into myself. So I am very appreciative of that. And it's been, yeah, wonderful ongoing relationship that's happening and i can say honestly that in the early days i had more face time with him now as he's become busy um, as the gdo and minister of book distribution and working for the bbt and also gbc services and as a guru uh that the time we spend together is less but it's always very memorable and I was privileged to, to spend time in the Bay Area 
uh, lately and assist him in, in different projects, San Francisco Center and other uh, projects. So I feel very, I feel very blessed to, to be part of his team. So when you were going through, I mean, the, the first phase of the, the gurus falling away, I imagine for the devotees in Switzerland wasn't that big of a, I mean, because... No, you could definitely notice that the earth was shaking because, you know, France is, and Italy and it's right next door. is right next door. Right. So um, there's definitely, it was noticeable. And also U.S., Rameshwar, others. So it was, it was uh, definitely noticeable. Yet, because we were kind of living in a bubble, this is pre-internet. Got it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Harikesh Maharaj, he started COM, so we had some electronic means of communication. Yeah, that got us. approximately? That started in mid-80s. Okay. I mean, I'm not too... Sure, sure, sure. Much into the going and into the years, but I know he was on the cutting edge. Yeah, to organize mind. it for his zone and especially for the BBT, so they could communicate and work on efficiently, efficiently on the books while being in different geographical locations. Initially, it was bring everybody to Korshin's car, bring everybody to Sweden. But well, it was hard because you got you got thirty or forty languages. Some of those passports are not so well appreciated in certain parts of Europe. It's not so easy to keep people there. It was just difficult. What to speak of cost effectiveness. So that was a help. So yeah, we were living in a bubble and you could say it was, it was working to some extent. Some things were working great. Other things were not working so great, but we were not really aware of it. So we couldn't yeah. be that much bothered. Yeah. The problem came just as we saw that as, as the movement was shifting from monastic life to being more congregation based, we saw that there wasn't for the most part a real game plan on how to, to transition I see. individually or collectively. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so everyone was kind of just making up their own script, trying to figure it out. Initially, people were faced with arranged marriages that either the temple president or the gurus or the GBC said, okay, to pair them up uh, or people just took took things into their own hands yeah. and neither really worked that great mm -hmm. so uh, it wasn't much there wasn't much education there wasn't much help nor many role models of, of Grihastas who had figured yeah. it out there was a few proper disciples who for the most part already came into the movement as couples yeah. or got married very early on so we just yeah, so there was some there was some homework to do. There was some growing up, you know, some some of that. In the years leading up to when Hari Maharaj ended up departing, would the devotees notice anything? Was there any kind of indication there was he was having, you know, his, his situation wasn't sustainable or was he was starting? Well, there was indications for a long time, but you know, when when you're we were busy distributing books and, and out there on a mission. He, he was sick a lot. He, there was a lot of physical ailments and, and we weren't that close. You know, yeah. there was, it wasn't like... It's a big, you, big zone, a lot of responsibilities. So you wouldn't have a lot of... Books yeah. And, and it's not like you're hanging out with the guru and yeah. you're watching his every move. Yeah. It, it was really, you know, this is a general and you're a foot soldier yeah. and you're doing your, you're doing your duty. Yeah. Even later on, when I was a minister, I was observing him uh, on the GBC. He was, you know, GBC chairman, BBT chairman, SMPDC, which now is TOBP chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yet, I was assisting, I was also serving him personally, but it wasn't that type of relationship where, where yeah. you were really... Uh, privy to what was going on yeah, yeah, yeah. behind the, the official, sure. the official, there was, there was some signs that, that things were not always great, but then again, you're not really trained to, to Look, question or yeah. to, to Look challenge. Yeah. And so, yeah, then things were, were 
were kind of taking a, a wrong direction in, in 98, but that's a whole, you know, that's a whole, that's a whole genre or topic in and of itself. I don't know if you want to get into the whole <laughs> discussion about well, what happened yeah. and, and who did what and why it transpired. Maybe that's, you know, part of a different type of a, yeah, there's a different lot of, type of a, I mean, that's the nature of history, you know, there's different yeah. people have different perspectives. Yeah. And it's sometimes it's impossible to say conclusively it went down like this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just interested from your perspective, kind of what it was like, what you observed. And also for you then, when he did step down from that service, how did that impact you? What were you going through? What did you think? What was your reaction? How did you, how did you manage? And especially, how did you manage to get through it to the point that now you're still so actively involved in this? Well, so when, when, when it hits the fan, you know, there is all the different psychological responses. First, there's denial. Sure. Then, then there is, you know, pointing blame, you know, then there is acceptance. Yeah. Then it's okay, what can we do about this? Do you still wait and hope for improvement? Yeah. And then when things don't improve, you have to see what are your options and how do we move forward? Yeah. Luckily, I had some exposure. So I had some mentors, some guides, a more global perspective than most of the devotees who just knew their home temple and they have been to India maybe a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. So I knew that ISKCON was diverse and there was different gurus and teachers and ways of doing things out there. Yeah. And it, there wasn't like the way, but it was more nuanced, so to speak. Yeah. And that, that helped to some extent, but you know, when you're going through the storm, <laughs> nothing helps. <laughs> you get wet, you get scared and you get hammered. That's yeah. just, that's just the way. And all you can do is try to get through of it and, and come out of it. And it, it's not like just going away and blows over and the sun's back out and, yeah. and everyone's, you know, taking out their, their candies and their ice cream. Yeah. So different teachers who were more dominant, they became more prominent in my life, different uh, people who, who, who were good to me. Before, uh, I, I just connected with them on a, on a deeper level and took their guidance. And so I can say that that Prabhupada saved me and, and the mercy of the devotees and my service, especially that I just took shelter of Prabhupada's teachings. And uh, yeah, that was, and then Krishna just works miracles. He just uh, does the magic. When we're ready to, I was in, I transitioned into household life and I, I three children, my, my own business in Switzerland. So then when we go through our own life and we reassess our own, our own life and our own aspirations, then Krishna, Krishna is always there. I mean, Krishna never, never leaves us. Yeah. And so Krishna is very responsive when we are trying to make an endeavor to reconnect and to 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 pursue what has been good to us in the past. Mm. I mean, the process works. It worked then, it works now, because it's Sanatana Dharma, it's the eternal process yeah. of Krishna consciousness. Then it can work anywhere at all times. It's really just a matter of getting on with it. And, and uh, yeah, the mind is tricky. It's easy to, to find excuses to say, oh, it's this person's fault or it's that person's fault or it's the institution's fault. Instead of asking ourselves, well, you know, what's the lesson? What can I learn from this? And what's my homework? Where, where do I have attachments? Where do I have things that I need to, to improve on? And I was, yeah, it was very painful, but I was forced to go through that process as far as the guru goes, as far as the institution goes, as far as uh, the nation and the family goes. 
Yeah. And we all have those Vidura moments where we're, you know, going for a long Japa walk and we're not sure. Do I really want to head back or do I just want to keep going? <laughs> yeah. But that's the Bhagavatam. That's, that's, that's our tradition. Yeah. It's meant to be like that. It's not if, it's only when those moments happen. And they will happen inevitably sooner or later. And then if we have guidance, we have good association and taste, taste for, for the process, for the practice, then we can carry through these, these, these times. I say I'm still struggling. I mean, I've been struggling pretty much all my life without getting too autobiographical. Uh, but material life is, you know, spiritual life may be difficult, but material life is impossible. So <laughs> better struggle for Krishna. Yeah, that's right. And it's a blissful struggle. Yeah. So might as well accept that, yeah, we didn't read the fine print, you know, material world is Janmam Ritu Jaravi Adi Dukadosh Anudarshanam, birth, death, disease, and old age. And uh, it's, it's inevitable. It's a package deal. Don't think this will not happen to you. Yeah. And now I was in the Bay Area and people are telling me, oh, you're too old. And then I go to other places and people say, oh, you're just a baby. And I'm like, okay, you know, maybe I just uh, have to accept that it's never going to be perfect. Yeah. I just have to try to be of service, try to be an instrument, see the need. What is it that people are requiring here? How can I be part of the solution and take myself self out of the center and then Krishna will will do his magic. Nice. So I'm, you could say, closer to, to many of my Shiksha gurus than I could ever be close to my Diksha gurus. Yeah. Just situational, circumstantially. Yeah. But that's pretty much our tradition. Yeah. It's and so now it's a very interesting phase of the Hare Krishna movement because those who got trained by Prabhupada are rapidly passing on. So we, we are facing again a, a generational uh, change and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a little obscure because there's a lot of homework to be done in terms of Guru Tattva, in terms of uh, exorcism with you know the ghosts of the guru so acharya area and a few other ghosts that we have sure, sure. kind of inherited and and also fed and yeah. kept alive yeah and so now it's really to see okay what's the most important thing to do right now and to ask ourselves that and then arrange our lives in such a way that we're empowered to actually be part of the solution rather than be part of the problem mm. On this topic of uh, the diction. So I could go into a lot of details on, you know, what happened in 98 or what happened here and there, but. Yeah, I'm not sure maybe it's necessary. Yeah, otherwise we'll do that another time. Maybe it's part two. Yeah, but I met uh, Harikesh Prabhu several times afterwards, and it's been good. And it's very nice to see how. The process works and Krishna never forgets his devotees, especially those who have uh, fully sacrificed and given a lot. And so everyone's going through life and we're going through our phases. So it's nice to see how, how things evolve and, and I'm convinced that the best years are yet to come. Not just because I'm a long-term optimist, but I know that. The best years are yet to come for ISKCON. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also individually. Oh, yeah. I mean, if we stick with the process. Yeah. So, Even though sometimes it may look a little convoluted and a little hazy. Yeah. And right now it seems like, you know, we're grappling with a few topics and Sometimes it looks like we've lost the cue ball and yeah, yeah. trying to find it. Yeah. But the process still works. There is unlimited amounts of very sincere, dedicated uh, souls who are sacrificing for the mission and they're empowered. And, and Krishna Shakti Nahita Tara Pravartana, Krishna spreads this movement, his teachings, um, through his devotees. Yeah. And there's nothing that can obstruct that.
if if I'm not in a proper state of consciousness, then I might temporarily remove myself from the association of devotees, from the Sankirtan Yagya, and try a few other things, and then eventually, hopefully, sooner than later, reconnect, yeah. and again be part of, of that Sankirtan Yagya. And so right now, this, this, this concept of one world team, and we're all in the same team, we're on the same team, and it's... It's powerful. It's, is Mahaprabhu's Sankirtan team, and she is in charge. Shimatra Radharani runs the show, is, is a powerful concept, and it's a powerful realization. And I feel we, that's what Prabhupada, Prabhupada called his leaders to Mayapur and said you should discuss unity and diversity every year. Because if you're not convinced, how can you convince anyone else? Yeah. So my, my service right now is mostly going around, working with up and coming leaders, trying to encourage them, trying to help them in whichever small way I possible to their, to their service better and also to sustain them in the sense that sometimes you may not have that much, uh, that much coming from above. Sure. And you have to make up your own script, which is sometimes a little scary. Sure, sure. Because it's not really what you learned uh, in school or in Bhakta programs, <laughs> all of a sudden you're at the bright old age of, of 23 and you're a minister or some were at the bright old age of 21 or 22 and they were zonal acharyas and then we expected them to be God. And then later on, it didn't work, work out that great. So who is there to blame? Yeah. Surest formula for utter failure or misery is unrealistic expectation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think we, we, we ace that one. Yeah. So, yeah. You, the, some, some devotees, they choose to get reinitiated. Some yeah. devotees don't. Some devotees are kind of unsure what should be done, what should not be done. What was your personal experience with that? You see, initially it was a lot of confusion because we just, we weren't in the know. These were not topics that were to be discussed. But then, you know, because some were too big to fail, then sure. when, when it did eventually happen, I said, let's wait, let's give it some time and, and see how things pan out. If, when it became clear after a few years that there was no, no change of, of, uh, of MO, then I, I just deepened my relationship with my Shiksha gurus, with my mentors, and the most prominent of them, uh, I, I retook initiation from him after 10 years or 11 years after my first Diksha Guru left. So, I mean, some people say you have to absolutely do it. Others say you're absolutely not allowed to do it. So it's like, damn if you do, damn if you don't. Yeah. Shastra tells very clearly that if a Guru becomes a sense enjoyer, becomes a Mayavadi, becomes hostile to Vaishnavas or an Aparadi, then you have every right, in fact, you're encouraged to, to take Mantra Diksha again. Yes. So it's there in our, in our scriptures. Yes. But because we didn't have a precedent in our ISKCON society, so there were different opinions on it. Again, legislation is one side, but it's more the culture. And so ultimately we have to do what we feel is the right thing to do. <clears throat> and for me, that was to wait and give the person a chance to reform and to change their ways. Since that didn't happen, I had to move on and, and you know, connect uh, on a deeper level with some of my teachers. And that has worked for me. Some, they immediately, you know, the king is dead, long live the king. They immediately jumped and went somewhere else and then later on went somewhere else and then again went somewhere else. And others, they said, Prabhupada is the only thing and no one else can be guru. Others said, uh, this whole thing is anyway not required. We can just chant Hare Krishna and that's the main thing and that takes care of everything. So, a little more balanced, a little more nuanced approach yeah. is what worked for me. I hope we will have some more guidance on this topic of Guru Tattva and also what happens when 
a leader has difficulties in their lives, how should we treat that? Yeah. We know from Sundarananda Vidya Vinod, who was Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada's one of his main, one of his main yeah. men, he wrote a letter to his Gurudev saying he would like to be relieved of the responsibility of taking care of that farm. They had a farm in South India where the sannyasis and leaders who had fall downs and difficulties, they were sent there for reformation for one or two years. And if they, they had to wash their own clothes, uh, do menial service, and if they complied with that program, they were reinstated in their previous positions. And if not, they were sent home. Nobody knew about that farm, except a very few people. So he asked his Gurudev to relieve him of the responsibility of managing that farm because he said, I know everything about everyone and it's really weighing down on my bhajan. They didn't have the internet and they didn't feel the need of telling everybody everything about who did what to whom, yeah. according to my version. And so I think we should become a little more sensitive and at least humane, what to speak of Vaishnav, to, to accept that or if we study the Bhagavatam, everyone's having difficulties. Yeah. And you can say, oh, this is Leela. Yeah, but why is it, why is it there in the Bhagavatam yeah. <laughs> to teach us that? Yeah. A Brahma Bhuvanal Loka Punavarti Nojana, from Brahma down to the end, is a struggle. And we have these case studies in the Bhagavatam and also in our own society and also in our own lives. Now, how do we deal with that? Do we just put it out there into the open and the Prabhupada said, you, you, now you have prevented him from coming back to, to, to take up devotional service because you have, you have exposed his, his fall down publicly. So as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, reprimanded um, Keshava Kashmiri in private and not in public, yeah. not in front of, of his own, of Nimai Pandit students, yeah because it was just, there was etiquette, there was culture. Yeah. There was no such thing. It was not acceptable. Also poaching, that we go around and we take people who already initiated and we grab them and we get them initiated again and we try to pull them over this camp, that camp. There was culture. Yeah. There was Vaishnava behavior. So that's, I feel, what we should try to emulate and strive for. And again, it's not really by legislation, it's more by reinforcing by proper role models what is the right way hmm. to to act and to also accept that that as long as people are in this world there is the conditional nature the human side that means sometimes there may be mistake in judgment mistake in action mistake in, in speech and and we have to be able to contextualize that that doesn't mean that we say it didn't happen or we, we condone it but we should be able to deal with it in a, in a, in a mature, in a Krishna conscious way. Yeah. Well, that means not like, okay, let's get rid of him or to say it never happened or to say it's Leela huh? or, <laughs> or, or just cancel culture. You know, somebody says one wrong word and eh, press the button and they go down the chute, you know, Yeah. which nowadays is a very, very popular way of how to deal with situations or with people yeah because again of that pol polarization mm. but it's a big topic in and of itself without going too much into sociology um i'm very grateful to to be here today and to be part of iskan to be part of this Hare krishna movement i see that the world is more and more uh, ready and willing and open to to appreciate this practice this culture this philosophy this process and it's really up to us how we how we interact especially the leaders to yeah. to get a little more traction to get a little more uh, a little more impact right now in many places we're very concerned about efficiency yet effectiveness is what really counts on the long run mm because who cares about how much volume you put through your machine? People want to know what's your output. Yeah. So we're very good at first contact. We're very good at making a splash. But then when it comes to actually bringing people closer, training them and keeping them, uh, there's ways to go. 
And that's, I feel, where we should put some concentrated effort to sit down together and figure out how can we have a cradle to grave, a more sustainable approach so that the children and the children of our children will actually feel, hey, yeah, this is, this is good. Yeah. I, I want to do this. I want to be part of this. Yeah. And not like, let me run to <laughs> the other side of the globe. Yeah. Of course, we know even if you go to New Zealand, Krishna is already there waiting for you. <laughs> now you, go, <laughs> you go to Queen Street in, in New Zealand, in Auckland, you know, there's already devotee distributing books. And, and I know Guru Kulis from, from the US who, 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 who went to work and travel in Sweden and, and met devotees and, and joined the Hare Krishna movement after being out of it for so many years yeah. because, because what they saw was just not attractive. Yeah. So ultimately, people are not looking so much for the perfect philosophy. They're really looking for authenticity for for integrity they're very averse to hypocrisy yeah. and because narcissism is a globalized phenomena we we ought to have some some forms of assessment where we can individually and collectively introspect and see are we really doing what Prabhupada wanted us to do is it is it is it working or are there some ways how to improve it otherwise it may be very soon till we're caught in offside till we're caught in a compromised situation and uh and it becomes quite evident and painful that we have to do some major adjustments yeah jumping ahead to more recent times you've been mentioning you got involved in preaching in san francisco how did that come about my spiritual master asked me in 2015 to, to open a center in San Francisco. So I was already in touch with devotees there, I had visited there, I'm close to Vaisheshika Prabhu. And so I was, yeah, excited and I went there and I was happy to be part of a team who, who who is still running a center in San Francisco. Yeah. And to me, leadership is what happens when you're not there. There is a point where we have to step back and see maybe there are younger people who are better suited for, for this role. Yeah. I'm 55. There's a 35 year old who is running the center. Yeah. And is very talented and much better equipped to do that. And I'm better at doing other things. Yeah. And so it's good to, to make that shift. It took a few years to set things up and small community has formed also with some support and, 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 uh, guidance from it's kind of Silicon Valley of Mountain View. So yeah, the center is there, it's running, but knowing the Bay Area, the potential that is there, there could be a dozen temples yeah. in that area. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's like huge. Prabhupada went in a train from North India through Delhi and in Delhi, in the train station, one Indian man got on and he, he went into the compartment and he said, Swamiji, we need a center here. We need a, we need a temple here. And Prabhupada said, so you will help. And the man said, yes, I will help. The Prabhupada looked around. There was maybe a dozen disciples traveling with Prabhupada on the train. And Prabhupada said, you, 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 and you get off the train. And he gave them 50 rupee loan <laughs> to start a center in Delhi. The man was a little crazy. You know, he, he thought if the devotees were chanting to some old batteries that they would recharge again by the chanting. And, and he had them sleep in some concrete uh, floor uh, shed, but now there is 15 marble temples in Delhi because of Prabhupada's vision, because of the blood, sweat and tears of all the devotees who sacrificed. So 
it's really about vision. There is no scarcity of resources. Yeah. And whenever we get together and we actually do Sankirtan, Samyakirtan, that complete that congregational chanting and glorification of Krishna's holy name, then then Srimad Radharani sends all facility and all all opportunity yeah. to do that. And it goes in waves. Some places are up, some places are down, some places are struggling. But in an overall, I would say 50 years in, something's there, something's happening. And Prabhupada was very happy to start small. He was standing under that tree, chanting Hare Krishna with a small pair of symbols. He had the three volumes of the first canto. And yes, he, 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 he knew that there was a there was a time, a sense of urgency, but at the same time, he was also happy to start small. He wasn't like anxious or, or in a rush. And he was treating everybody who walked through the door as a future leader of the Hare Krishna movement. Yeah. That's the impression I got from the people I talked to and from what I read and yeah. watched. And it was some pretty funky people who walked through those doors. Yet what happened, because Prabhupada chose to see the, the potential rather than the deficiency, they became the future leaders of the Hare Krishna movement. Yeah. And they did great things. And, and some of them did terrible things. And some bombed out royally. But Krishna accepted the, the sacrifice and the, the goodness of their offering. And, uh, and we're here today because of the, because of the, hard work and the tears and the prayers of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. So I feel I'm very privileged. We're, it's still available. If you want to have that, uh, that, uh, pioneering flavor, <laughs> I'm in South America and Central America right now. I've been, uh, to Africa. So that flavor is still available. And there's some places who are very established where it's more like church. It's more like corporate is gone. Yeah. And some of us go like, well, that's not really my thing, or that's not really why I joined. But we should also understand that different people have different needs, and we should be happy that they are happy. Yeah. And what can we do to help them to also appreciate what, what worked for us? And in this way, there can be, again, that, that interdependence, that cross-pollination. Because we can't be successful without tradition, but we can't sustain without innovation. And that means giving the, the younger generations some say, and also some making them part of the vision. Yeah. Not just we tell you how it is and, uh, and then what, you know? They can go out into the world and get a job and take care of their own lives. But if they see that there's something for them here in this movement, and they can be part of developing the narrative, you'd be surprised. There's, there's brilliant, brilliant people, especially, I mean, on all, on all, in all age groups. <laughs> I'm kind of part of the, 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 the survivors. You don't see too many, you know, 45 yes, to, yeah. to 60, to 60 year olds. It's, it's a bit thin because, uh, you know, we did some human experiments. We, we, we had some, <laughs> there was, it was a bumpy road. So we lost a lot of people. And it's good that some historians will, will sit down and, and, and analyze, okay, what, what worked, what worked great, what didn't work at all. And what can we learn from this? But history tends to repeat itself. I don't think that most people really care too much about history. <laughs> Everyone thinks, no, no, I can do this. I've, I've got it figured out. Yeah. And yeah, Arjuna thought he had, he had it figured out. And then he realized that he was at the end of his wisdom, that, that it didn't really work out so well. But he was willing to hear. And he was very fortunate because Krishna showed him very clearly what are his options. And and he gave him guidance. So if we are willing to take guidance, if we're willing to do the, the, the sacrifice and the sweet surrender, this voluntary surrender, then Prabhupada, Krishna, our spiritual masters, they will empower us. Yeah. 
the process works. That's what I, that's what I have seen. Which role are we going to play? It's really up to Krishna. I mean, we can try and we can try to go through our bucket list at some point. You're done ticking boxes. And then what's next? Like, is there a life after initiation? Is there a life after being a guru or a GBC or a sannyasi? Or what if your kids and your grandkids are grown? Is there something else to do? I believe so. <laughs> it's a good life. But we have to live it. And, and then others will see that, yeah, this is a role model. This is a person who I would like to emulate. Otherwise, if we're grumpy young men or middle-aged men, it's just not very attractive. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good place to conclude and we can follow yes. to do a part two sometime. Yeah, whatever you, you like to hear more of, I'm, I'm available. Okay. Again, it's hard not to get too autobiographical and, and uh, getting into, you know, what happened in 86 and what happened in 98. But I think that's not the main thrust of, of, of your project. It's more to give people an overall. So in concluding, I'm really grateful that there was a clear sense of mission, a clear sense of direction, not just in terms of numerical strength of what needed to be done, but it was a, a, team, a team effort, a team spirit. When we came to Mayapur, everybody went together on Parikrama. Everybody ate prasadam together. Everybody was in the morning program together. There was no such thing as people having different programs or different uh, places or different parikrams or different things to do. It was one unit, one family. At least the first two times I went, 86, 89. Then in mid-90s, he kind of slowly, slowly started. It just became very big, so some people started doing their own things. Yeah. And now that's kind of the new normal. It's kind of the norm. Yeah. But it kind of takes away a little bit of that. Yeah. Mood. Of course, nostalgia, you know, has its moments and it's maybe overrated, but why not? It's important. We gotta, everyone has to find their, their sangha, their family, you know, you have yeah. to find your associates within the larger movement. Totally. That you can feel like you have people that care about you, that support you, that you yeah. can take shelter of in difficult times. Yeah, but then also, Accountability, like if if someone is especially in leadership position and they don't have visible sadhana, that's a red flag. Yeah. That's a red flag. You see, they're not they're not attending programs. They're not going to Mangalardi. Are they chanting their rounds? Are they following regs? And it's not like you have to live in a van and distribute you know eight thousand books a minute in order to be legit. But do you know the philosophy, the culture, and the ethos of this movement? Yeah. Or have we just bought the t-shirt and we got the tattoo and now we think we're part of something. And of course, it will become very broad and that's understood. Yet, as educators, we should ensure that anybody who comes to the movement actually gets a fair go. They have a, a fair chance of getting uh, a level of education which which will permit them to sustain their Krishna conscious practice yeah. because they have been trained in the tenets of, of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. I've done surveys around the globe and less than 10% of our members have the books Please. and have read all the books. When was the first time you did that survey? Do you remember which year? Uh, all throughout. I keep on doing it doing. periodically because it's kind of part of my spiel when I when I give a Sunday feast lecture, then I have a Bhagavatam set there, and then I ask them, how many of you have read these books? And show of hands, maybe 10%. How many of you have a set? Maybe 10%. Mm -hmm. I say, how many of you would like to have a set? And in Philadelphia, 23 people took a Bhagavatam set because, because I asked them. Yeah. And, and they felt, yeah, maybe it's a good idea, you know? Like proper kind of went on the Jaladutta to bring us the Bhagavatam. So maybe it's not a bad idea to have a Bhagavatam. <laughs> and of course I have you know, two sets of hard copies and three electronic versions. And so this whole idea of it's either this or that is really not such a, such a good approach because the, the, the key word is and. Yeah. 
not or. So the more we appreciate diversity, the more we can actually focus and, and, and rejoice in our unity. Yeah. If we just have one without the other, it really becomes, it really becomes uh, unsustainable. It just becomes a little yeah. imbalanced. That's a good point. So, thank you for your time, and we, I hope we could share a couple of a couple of points from how we experienced the. I was definitely fortunate to be part of the Hare Krishna explosion in at least from eighty four to eighty seven, eighty eight to the end of eighties. Actually, things were rapidly rapidly growing yes yeah 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 rapidly happening and then early 90s 91 russia opened up and that started booming yeah and so yeah yet there is again many many places and many frontiers that that we haven't yet that we haven't yet really penetrated because we're kind of a little insular right now. We've gotten very confident and comfortable to do 10 million books a year and to, 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 to have a few temples and a few disciples and a few people who watch and listen to us. There are Buddhist monks in Taiwan who have 2 million disciples. We can't even pronounce their names. We don't even know they exist. So, <laughs> good is the enemy of great. Prabhupada wanted excellence. He said, I have one disease. I cannot think small. Yeah. I, you know, so shoot for the rhino. Do something big. What's the use of being American or Bengali or Swiss or, or you know, <clears throat> or Colombian if you can't do something great, wonderful. something wonderful for Krishna? So Prabhupada was really good in, in, in upping the ante of giving us that fresh challenge. At the same time, he was also very kind and considerate and he appreciated whichever service anyone did. So he, he really exemplified that perfect balance between tradition and innovation or one time he wrote to a temple president, Oh, you're the temple president now. So you have to be, you have to be very strict. And then the next sentence was, and you have to be very liberal. There's two sentences right next to each other. For Prabhupada, that was not a contradiction. That wasn't mutually exclusive. Yeah. It was, it was his formula. He was strict on the principles and on the philosophy, yet he was compassionate and considerate in the application to, to make sure everybody felt that they're, they can do this and they're part of this. Yeah. Like posting the regular the principles after the first initiation on the door. By the way, you know, uh, you get to follow four eggs and chant 16 rounds, which is kind of a trick, but it worked. You know, they were already too attached to him to, to drop the ball. So, he, 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 he's really our founder Acharya and we're very fortunate that we get to associate with his disciples and the disciples of his disciples and so many others yet to come. Like when you reach it on Acharya it's a multi-guru society. Everybody's a guru of sorts and they're all cooperating and collaborating and there's no of this Maryada Vatikrama, you cannot be a teacher in, in the presence of your teacher. When, when Shukadeva Goswami was instructing Parikshit, there was five generations of gurus present at the same time. Yeah. And everybody was happy that a 16-year-old naked boy who walked out of the forest came and became the guru of the king. So we see there, there is no Futternight, there is no this, uh, this, this envy or this, this uh, territorialism, this insecurity. Yeah. But it's a real mood of, of collaboration and of your success is my success and your difficulty is my difficulty and that is to me the spirit of Prabhupada, the spirit of the Sankirtan movement of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the mood of Vasudev Data. what can we do to, to, to help these souls and what are we willing to, to sacrifice in order to, to achieve our, our, our contribution to this ISKCON movement. Yeah. And also loyalty, loyalty and fidelity, this chastity. It's not just something that we take out on a Sunday feast class, you know, about what women are supposed to do or not to do. What about me as a disciple? 
Do I have discipline? Am I chaste to Prabhupada's movement and his instructions? Am I loyal? Am I faithful? Because it's easy to get confused in this opportunistic environment of, hey, you can be anything, you can do anything, and everything's cool. Why? Because your mind tells you to? Or because somebody in the University of YouTube told you to? But to really understand what is it that Prabhupada wanted to communicate to us, and how can we actually apply it and implement it, requires a little, a little, a little thought. So I'm glad to see that there are still some thinkers in, in, in the Hare Krishna movement. And because sometimes it's easy to get caught up just in accomplishments. Okay. How many numbers? How many, how many things have we, have we done yeah. so far? Prabhupada said, I, I'd be happy. I'd be pleased if you love Krishna. And because he knew he had full faith. Shraddha Shabde Vishwaskali Sudrida Nishoy had to have full faith that if that is there, everything else will come. Yeah. Just from that. And then Krishna will do the magic. So thank you for this opportunity. Hare Krishna. Prabhupada.